The following is a Game Influence Empire special presentation. This video may contain a mature language and graphic content. Stay tuned for a special presentation of first person shooter games on Super Nintendo. So here we are playing Faceball 2000 on the Super Nintendo. And uh, kind of looks like a computer. Look at it. It has a floppy disk drive on the bottom left hand. That's actually a little demonstration. Here's the title screen right here. It looks like a bunch of balls. Faceball 2000. Look at that. And uh, we are playing whole bunch of first-person shooters on the Super Nintendo today, so let's check this one out. It's the first one on the list. All right, so uh, let's choose whatever the hell this is right here. This is a very obscure first-person shooter on the Super Nintendo, and probably not the most well-known. And here it is right here, and it looks like we have a... some type of a ball-looking thing right here. It kind of resembles something that you would probably play on DOS. I guess the whole object of the game is to uh, kill smiley yellow faces that kind of look like that Walmart logo from back in the day. Alright, so uh, in this game basically that's what you do, you just shoot yellow faces. It's pretty interesting. Not really, but I guess it's something very, very different in a Super Nintendo. There wasn't really many first person shooters available for Super Nintendo, so... I would imagine that when this came out, uh, it was a very obscure, strange game that people might find a little bit of interest in because they're like, oh shit, look at this. This is a very different game. As far as I understand, there was only maybe about four first-person shooter games on Super Nintendo, and that was it. Pretty interesting to see this being played on Super Nintendo because, again, there wasn't so many of these games, but that's, that's mainly about it. There's nothing really much interesting about this game at all. Stay tuned for a special presentation of first person shooter games on Super Nintendo. And then we have Spectra for the Super Nintendo. Check this out. Looks like we uh, might be having a little bit of a title screen popping up here in a second. Fancy looking, look at that. Looks like some type of a planet. Uh, maybe that's the uh, developer, the publisher, or the other. Let's check this out. Alright, we have something purplish coming up on the screen right here. It's kind of purple looking. Look at that. We have a uh, triangle and we have the uh, Spectra logo. It's uh, about damn time. That took forever. Spectra came out and well, it looks like 1994 and it has a whole bunch of crap on the screen right there you can read. And again, it's one player or two player. Wow, look at that. I don't know, I've never played this before. We're just going to have to jump into the game and figure out what the hell we're supposed to be doing. Level 1, alright. What the hell is this? Wow, the frame rate is actually really nice on this game. This almost looks like that Battle Tanks game on the uh, NES. Or the Game Boy. I think it was on both. Hey, look at, look at this. This actually looks pretty good. You have a little radar on the top right. It looks like the yellow is actually the flags, so you have to actually click the flags right here. There's another flag up here you have to get. Well, what do you know? This game is actually not bad. I mean, it, it, from your point of view, you might, it might look boring because uh, you're not playing it, but I guarantee you that if you actually jump in and play it, it actually makes sense. And it has logic to it. Uh... Mainly, you just use that little radar on the top right there, and it's pretty much the red dots are the enemies, the yellow dots are the flags. And it's actually a pretty not bad game at all. It's actually pretty decent. And I'm actually surprised it actually runs this well on Super Nintendo. Look at it. It's, the frame rate runs really well. It's not bad at all. Game over. What the hell is that? Are you kidding me? Stay tuned for a special presentation of first person shooter games on Super Nintendo. And then we have the oh so famous Doom for the Super Nintendo. Now, if I actually owned this game a couple of times, uh, say I owned, probably I owned the Super Nintendo two or three times. 
And uh, this is one of the games I've always came across. And uh, right away, I'm already in the game. I'm already past the title screen. I didn't even push a button at all. That just threw me right into the game. How are you like that? As you may already know, this is probably not the best version of Doom. It's the subpar Super Nintendo version, but you have to pretty much take it for what it's worth because considering that it's running on the Super Nintendo and it's running this well, it's actually pretty good. So let's say if you did not have a DOS PC back in the day and you only had the Super Nintendo, well guess what? The only way for you to play Doom is unfortunately Super Nintendo, so it's going to have to deal with it. It is definitely not as good as the DOS version, but it's not that bad. It's actually playable. The frame rate does suck, but it is pretty much whatever. You can still shoot enemies and kill them, just like that, and there's still blood in the game. You know, back then, Nintendo loved to censor stuff, but this game wasn't really that censored as far as I know. You still have a lot of blood in the game. Except this ugly bastard here. And then, yeah, the graphics are actually a bit more pixelated than the uh, DOS version. Quite a bit more. But it plays, and it actually looks, for Super Nintendo standards, it looks pretty good. And uh, if you have a Super Nintendo, or let's say if it was years ago and you did not have a DOS PC, and you had no way of actually playing Doom except for Super Nintendo, then I'm pretty sure you will definitely enjoy playing this. It's actually not bad. You're just going to have to suffer with the frame rate issue, but... You see the frame rate's not that great, but... The game is playable. Stay tuned for a special presentation of first-person shooter games on Super Nintendo. And here we have our final first-person shooter on the Super Nintendo. Now, if there was any more, just let me know as far as I know. Uh, this is pretty much all I know of uh, on the Super Nintendo first-person shooters. Uh, we have the title screen right here, Wolf Scene 3D. Pretty badass title screen. Then we have a demonstration of the gameplay the computer is playing. Now, uh, this game was uh, pretty good. It has a much better frame rate than uh, Doom. It's actually very, very much playable. Uh, the only thing that kind of ruined the game was that they uh, censored it. Uh, yeah, Nintendo loved the censor stuff, so all those Adolf Hitler pictures on the wall. Unfortunately, it's not Adolf Hitler. And all those swastikas, it's definitely not World War II anymore. It's fictional. Everything's like all weird, censored, pretty much crappy looking. But nonetheless, it's pretty much the uh, same game. I mean, there might be a few levels missing, I'm not sure. And we have a little bit of a mission briefing right here, which the PC version did not have that. Uh, the, I believe the Atari Jaguar version had that. In fact, the Atari Jaguar version, in my opinion, was the best version of this game. I thought that was actually pretty good. Alright, so... Pretty much looks... Pretty much the same as the PC version, but it's much more, much more pixelated. The screening is not full screen once again, unfortunately. And then also, there's another uh, interesting thing about this game is that the uh, sprites, some of the sprites are missing, I guess. Because uh, the enemies, I don't think they have sprites of them looking away from you. I believe they always face you at all times. So no matter where you're walking, the enemy is actually looking towards you. And I believe that's the same for the uh, Jaguar version also, but... The thing about the Jaguar version is they actually have much more enhanced sprites that's even s superior to what the PC version has. It, that game actually looks really nice. This was another game that I actually owned on the Super Nintendo. It was actually pretty good. Except for the censorship kind of pissed me off. There's no sense in censoring the game. I, I heard that over in Germany, they any World War II game that features any Nazi symbols or mentioning they have to censor it over there which is kind of weird but this is pretty much what they would deal with on every single game that they have that has anything to do with Nazis at all even the modern wolf scene game the new order is fully censored over there in Germany and just got killed now, this game right here is subpar compared to the PC version but 
Again, it's not Super Nintendo, and for Super Nintendo standards, it's not bad. If you owned the Super Nintendo and you uh, didn't have a PC, once again, this is pretty much your way of getting a taste out of what you could play on the PC. Coming up next on the Classic Cartoon Network for Sega Genesis. So here we are playing Classic Cartoon Games on the Sega Genesis. And we are playing the Smurfs. And right here you have to select your uh, language. And we're going to select United Kingdom for English. And we have a Smurf introduction right here. It actually looks pretty cool. Look at that. Yeah, that was a very short introduction. Now we have the title screen. And it looks just like the uh, actual Smurf cartoon itself, the title screen. Look at that. And we have a, another little introduction right here. It's Act 1, which is basically level number 1, The Village. And uh, I'm 30 years old, so... Uh, back in, let's say, the late 80s, early 90s, we had Flintstones, Smurfs, and uh, Nickelodeon just started coming out with a lot of cool 90s cartoons. Well, back then, I would say Captain Planet, Rocky and Bullwinkle, and a lot of classic cartoons that previously came out in like the 70s and 60s, like Scooby-Doo. Those are great cartoons. So when the Sega Chances came out, one of the main things about Sega Chances is that it can actually take a cartoon and make it come to life. This actually looks like the real cartoon. Look at that. Bam! Pop out right, right out of the chimney. That's actually pretty awesome. So when the 16-bit consoles came out, especially the Sega Genesis, it was a pretty big thing that you can actually have Mickey Mouse being animated on your console. Or games like this, the Smurf. Uh, it was definitely a dream come true. Because you can actually play a video game and it looks just like the real thing. Now, as far as the game goes, whether it's good or bad, I would say, uh, I don't know. I actually think I did play this game before. I probably reviewed it at one point. You, you are not able to be hit by that little sandbag, so you can actually walk through the other smurf, but you can't touch the sandbag. You actually pop up out of the chimney right here. I think the first time I actually played this game, I did not have the patience actually play this game whatsoever and I never even really gave it a chance but second opinion on the game is actually not exactly that bad of a platformer it's a little bit slow but at least it's straightforward and not over the place because I hate platformers that have multi-level crap where you can't figure it out so this is pretty much straightforward you just walk through the door over right here time out Okay, it looks like I have a little bit of a time limit, which I did not pay attention to. Coming up next on the Classic Cartoon Network for Sega Genesis. The Flintstones for the Sega Genesis. This is another, I actually came out in the Mega Drive. Uh, this is another European-only game, as far as I understand. I don't think this released in the United States. Uh, this little demonstration, the computer actually playing the game right here, of how the graphics look. Uh, once again, this definitely does demonstrate the power of the uh, Sega Genesis. It gives you pretty close to a realistic look of what the actual cartoon looks like. I mean, look at that. It looks really nice. Now, I would imagine that the reason why Sega came out with uh, Sega CD was because uh, the Sega Genesis already had the graphics to bring actually cartoon games to life. They just couldn't add the actual voice into the game. Well, the Sega CD could. So, they actually solved that problem. Unfortunately, it wasn't the most popular thing in the world, and people did not understand it, but... Yeah, you can actually take a game like this and add voice to it, and it actually gave you, like, the whole damn cartoon. That's actually pretty cool. If you hold down, you can actually... Your head goes right down into your body like that. I remember seeing that in the cartoon. It's actually pretty cool. So this game feels a little bit more polished... Uh, in comparison to the Smurf game, but uh, nonetheless, the game actually uh, is pretty good. It's not that bad at all. This game, the animation on it, actually brings the cartoon definitely to life on the Sega Genesis. I mean, look at this. So uh, the developers did a pretty good job. It looks like the real thing. I'll say if you were uh, 
a fan of the Flintstones and you had a Sega Genesis back then, you'd probably be pretty happy with this. Okay, so that's basically what you have to do. You have to hit these snakes. Wow, that is so difficult trying to get up on that, uh... Oh, man. Let's forget about it. That's actually very challenging. Coming up next on the Classic Cartoon Network for Sega Genesis. And then we have this game right here. Another classic cartoon. It is Rocky and Bullwinkle. Definitely a, a classic. And we have the uh, introduction right here. It's pretty much going through all this animation and look at this. Rocky and Bullwinkle, look at that. So before the game starts, you have a little bit of a storyline introduction, much like the Flintstones. Alright, so I guess in this game you actually have mini games you can actually play, or you can actually uh, play the main game itself. We'll try the main game out. And check out the animation on that. The power of the Sega Genesis. That's one of the main um, advantages of the Sega Genesis when it first came out. I remember... Uh, before the Genesis came out, they actually had videos of it on some computer TV show. Uh, pretty much demonstrating that the Sega Genesis can actually bring cartoons to life on that console because of how good it is. Uh, the, the game does appear to be subpar compared to other video games that depict cartoons on the Sega Genesis. I mean, something that looks a little weird about this game. Look at this, you can actually climb up the, the mountain. What the hell is that? Never see a moose do that before? That bird just shit at me! There's not too many games where you can actually experience being crapped on by a bird, but... Yeah, this is one of them right here. I mean, where exactly do you find moose? You find them probably up in Maine, I would imagine. In the United States. I'm not sure if there's any... Moose anywhere else in the world. Maybe Russia, I don't know. But you, you let me know. Have you ever seen a moose climb up a mountain like this? this is, look at that. That thing tried to crap on me again. There's a blackbird. And the higher elevation you go, the more crazier things get. Oh, this thing is going to try to shit on me, and it missed, thank god. And now we're at the top of the mountain, alright. Yeah, what the hell is... is that a nest? What the hell? You can't shoot that way though, which kind of sucks. You can do that, I'm not sure what the hell that is, but... We'll save that for another topic. There, what the hell is all this? Man. That looks like it does not even belong in the game whatsoever. That, what, where the hell did that come from? So we'll try uh, one of the mini games right here. We'll try this one. I'm not sure what the hell this is, but it looks interesting. It looks like I'm riding a uh, donkey. And I can either jump up in the air or duck down. And you have to jump over obstacles. So that's actually pretty cool. I'm not exactly sure what year this came out, probably 93 or something like that, but I must say, it's actually, uh... It's actually fun to play. I'll admit, it's actually pretty fun. Let's try this game out. And I do recognize these characters from the Rocky Bullock cartoon, I used to watch it. Let's go check this out. So this appears to be like a boss of some sort, and I just got my ass fired big time. Yeah, I think the animation or the graphics that are subpar for the most part, they're not the greatest compared to the uh, the other games, but uh, the game's actually fun. Coming up next on the Classic Cartoon Network for Sega Genesis. And here we are playing Captain Planet in the Planet Tears. Check that out. Captain Planet, got the title screen right there. And there's Captain Planet himself, and we've got the Planet Tears right there on the bottom. It's definitely an awesome cartoon back in the day. Yeah, this appears to be a little demonstration of the actual game itself. You have rats running around the, uh... It's like where they're inside the sewer for some reason. And there's like liquid shit coming out of that little tube right there. Let's start the game. Now, this was a famous cartoon that was on TBS. Before you actually start the game, you actually have uh, what appears to be a series of enemies that you can choose to battle first. I mean, assuming that this is similar to like Mega Man, you have to choose what 
boss you want to battle. So let's choose this guy right here. Uh, it's giving you a whole rundown on that particular character. Your second set of a sewer with cockroaches and uh, rats, things like that. What the hell? Whoa, what was that? Was that a rat or a cat? Okay, so it looks like the sewer is actually being filled up with shit. Or whatever the hell that green nuclear looking crap is. It looks like something that you do not want to accidentally catch in your mouth because you might die. That does not make any sense whatsoever. You're just, I mean, you can easily just jump right here and walk across. Yeah, this is almost like that stupid Wings World game where the platformer is like over the damn place and I have no idea what the hell I'm doing right there, but this game is already uh, getting on my bad side. Oh my god, it's like one of those games where you have to take a guess on where the hell you're supposed to go. I feel like turning the game off. This is one of those platformers that is like, it's all over the damn place and I hate, I like platformers that are just straightforward. Especially on 16-bit consoles because it makes no sense to have a platformer that you have to try to guess on where you're supposed to go. And this is one of them right here, like I am completely lost. I don't know where the hell I am. The only thing I know is I am in a, what appears to be a sewer filled with all kinds of shit and rats and everything else. I mean, ain't that ridiculous? You can't even freaking kill yourself in the game. You're like 30,000 leagues underneath the sewer filled with liquid shit and you're still alive. I mean, what the hell? Finally! Alright. Well, that's the end of that game. Wait a minute, does that say Duke Nukem's? What the hell is that? Is there Duke Nukem's in this game? What the hell? Okay, so this is not the end of this game. Let's check this out. Alright, so apparently this is Duke Nukem's level. Alright, let's check this out. Now I'm a little bit more interested. So this is a completely different level. Again, this is almost like... Mega Man, in a certain extent, where you can actually choose different series of levels to play until you meet up with the boss, I would imagine. And uh, this is actual Duke Nukem's level right here. So you can actually battle against Duke Nukem. Ain't that something? Yeah, it's time to kick ass and chew bubblegum. I must say this level is a little bit better than the last one. The last one was pretty shitty. But still, I really don't know where the hell I'm going. But you know, back then games had manuals and they actually helped you out a little bit. You can actually try to figure out halfway of what you're supposed to be doing and you know that's the way things were back then but I don't have the manual for this game so there's really no way of telling so just for the hell of it let's try out the other uh, characters for here Hoggish Greedily Undersea Oil Rig yeah I hate, I hate this it's pretty much similar to the uh, sewer level but with just uh, slightly different graphics there's actually one more enemy that we have to choose. Let's pick it and get it done and over with. What the hell is this? It's gotta jump around and get shocked by lightning. I mean, what the hell? <laughs> this seems like like each freaking level in this game is like designed to screw you over. You have enemies coming from both directions. I mean, this looks like a freaking mess. I mean, look at this. This is a jump from platform to end up. Jumping is. I guess it's alright, but it's just clunky at the same time. It's not that good. Ooh, look how quick you die. Coming up next on the Classic Cartoon Network for Sega Genesis. So we need to get away from Captain Point. We need to wash the taste out of our mouth. We're going to play Garfield game. Caught in the Act. Let's check this out. You can see this game came out in 1995, and there's a title screen right there. Uh, definitely looks very promising. Uh, this appears to be a little demonstration of how the game looks, and the animation looks fantastic on that game. Look at that. And check that out. Yeah, this game definitely looks really nice. Look at that. Even the introduction on the Sega Genesis, when you first turn it on and you get the Sega logo, I've always been a fan of how each Sega Genesis game had its own customized introduction. Garfield was another very classic cartoon back in the day. It's definitely one of my favorites. Let's check this out and see uh, how we play this. It's supposed to jump on the spring and... 
I'm gonna say already this this game's a hundred times better than uh, Captain Planet. Actually, has a little bit of logic to it. And the graphics are actually really nice on this. Out of all the games I played so far today, this is probably uh, the most well polished cartoon game so far. Hey, look at this; it looks really good. And this was stuff supposedly developed directly from Sega, so they actually put all their efforts into this game. Look at this. I mean, you can tell that Sega went all out on this game. This, every little aspect of the actual character itself, there's tons of animation on that character. If you walk to the edge of this little stone right here, he looks like he's losing his, losing his balance. If you stand still... Look at this. He's looking back and forth, trying to figure out what to do. See right here that he's almost losing his balance, but not quite. He, there's actually a separate animation for that. That's actually pretty crazy. Alright, let's see if I can get somewhere in this game. So I have no idea what the hell I'm doing. You can see my character just died right there, and the animations, look at that! This is probably one of the best animated games on the Genesis, I would say. I've never seen a game animated so well before. This is nice. And we're gonna head back up here. This game is actually pretty damn good so far. I've never actually taken the chance of actually playing this game, but I'm actually, the graphics for here look amazing. Look at that. Looks like we have Odie up there, and he's trying to mess me up. So the difficulty on the game is not exactly uh, easy, but uh, this is a game that anyone can pick up and enjoy playing because it's just, it just looks really nice. Uh, this is probably the best looking cartoon game I've ever seen on Genesis. Is that Street Fighter 2 you're playing? Why, no it's not. But it looks like a pretty good alternative to Street Fighter 2. Let's check it out. Sun's off. I mean, look at that logo. That looks pretty cool. Here we are playing World Heroes on the Super Nintendo. Quite the famous game on the uh, Neo Geo. It is considered by many a Street Fighter 2 ripoff, but for uh, me, I consider it the alternative. I think it's pretty good. Let's check this game out. Start the game, and here we have the uh, ugly looking fellow over right there. And this is your character select screen, which uh, may look quite similar to uh, what you see on Street Fighter. Now, what's cool about this game, you can either have a fatal match or a normal match. So, we'll check the normal out first. Now, that definitely uh, looks like, obviously, a screen you would see in Street Fighter 2, but whatever the case may be, many people refer to this as the ripoff of Street Fighter 2. Let's check it out. So here we have the game right here, and it looks awesome. And it plays just like Street Fighter. So I can definitely see where people come from. Well, this is a Street Fighter ripoff, but... I think it's just as good as Street Fighter. That was an awesome move. Did you see that? It's like freaking power bomb. Like, oh shit. <laughs> character. This time we're going to try a Fatal Match. This, was, this is something that Street Fighter 2 does not have. This is actually pretty cool. So basically, it's like a wrestling match, and if you touch the perimeters of the ring, it's on fire, so you actually get damaged, and see, you actually catch on fire. So think of this as like one of those infernal matches that WWE has. And in this stage right here, you have an, uh, an actual, what appears to be an electric barrier. So instead of catching on fire in this match, it's very, very possible that you can get electrocuted, just like that right there. What the hell is that? Those are the biggest freaking hands ever. Is that Street Fighter 2 you're playing? Why, no it's not. But it looks like a pretty good alternative to Street Fighter 2. Let's check it out. Here we are playing a Data East game. The Data East is definitely uh, my favorite video game company logo. That logo definitely looks awesome. And uh, we are playing Fighter's History. Which is apparently another game that closely resembles Street Fighter 2 to a certain extent. And uh, we have a computer battle, survival, which I'm assuming is arcade, versus a uh, setup, which one would assume that it's probably the option menu. Alright, so this is your uh, select screen right here, and it does sort of look like uh, something you would see on Street Fighter a little bit. Uh, they changed it up quite a bit, so it doesn't look quite the same. 
And the uh, controls are pretty much the same as Street Fighter. So I can definitely see where people are coming off saying that this is uh, another sort of ripoff of Street Fighter 2, but it definitely looks quite a bit different. I will say it's definitely a pretty good alternative. I never actually played the game before, but the controls are actually good enough to actually enjoy. Say so that if you're used to playing uh, Street Fighter 2, you probably would have no problem playing this game because the controls are literally identical. What would make the game even more awesome is if that police officer whipped out a billy club and started beating the shit out of both of us and the game ended with a draw. You can even fight in front of the new Trump Plaza, check that out. This game is definitely a must play in my book. Hidden Gem out of Super Nintendo is definitely pretty good. Very, very nice Street Fighter 2 alternative. Though. Is that Street Fighter 2 you're playing? Why, no it's not. But it looks like a pretty good alternative to Street Fighter 2. Let's check it out. So upon doing research, this is another game that supposedly is a pretty decent alternative to Street Fighter 2. The game is known as Power Instinct for the Super Nintendo. And uh, let's check out exactly what this game is about. Because I uh, don't quite recall playing this game either. And we do have a versus mode life attack and game start. We're just going to start the game and try to figure out what this is. And uh, this is the uh, select screen right here. It does not look anything like Street Fighter, I can tell you that much. Alright, so right away I'm actually fighting myself, which is unusual, because usually in these games you actually uh, start off with a uh, opposite opponent. Somewhat the controls are similar to Street Fighter. Well, at least spitting the fire out of your fist, like a, you know. Alright, well, yeah, I will say so. That's definitely just like Street Fighter. If you're playing as Ryu or Ken, the punching is actually better than Street Fighter, I would say. It's like more impactful, in my opinion. It feels like you really punch him in the frickin' face. Fake Oyukin! That was the best fake Oyukin ever. The no Oyukins, you can do an Oyukin in this game, and it's actually uh, pretty good. The spin kick that Ryu does, uh, he d unfortunately, this character doesn't do it, so I'm not sure if they reserved that move for another character or what, but. And the uh, controls are pretty much identical to Street Fighter 2, which I guess I could see how this game is a. Definitely an alternative to Street Fighter 2. Is that Street Fighter 2 you're playing? Why, no it's not. But it looks like a pretty good alternative to Street Fighter 2. Let's check it out. And then for our final game, uh, for today we will be playing Tough Enough. For, and right away you get like a very interesting uh, little story to the game, similar to what you would see in Street Fighter 2. So this is pretty much your main menu right here. You can do uh, versus computer, one player versus two player or the storyline. And uh, these are your characters right here. Uh, uh, they look pretty similar to, uh, instead of Street Fighter characters, they look like Streets of Rage characters. You can actually choose your enemy, which is pretty cool. And the uh, background graphics look nice. They have a weird effect, like something hazy in the background. Just, you can see the clouds moving. The, uh, the controls are very similar to Street Fighter once again, so. It's actually a really nice fighting game. Yeah, this is a surprise. This game is actually, uh, the controls are just as good as Street Fighter 2. They may be slightly different, but they're basically the same. And, uh, the game actually plays pretty well. I like it. Oh, wow, you actually get replays in this game. Now, that's something that, uh, you don't see that often back then. Slow motion replay. That is pretty awesome. Check that out. has a very, very unique feature in this game that I've not seen in pretty much any other fighting game from uh, that time period. And, uh, that's a bonus. There appears to be a lot more enemies than, uh, what appears to be on the character select screen, which is interesting. Alright, so on this stage right here, it looks like we're in some type of a space station, and the, uh, yeah, the background graphics are pretty nice. You can definitely see there's, like, multiple levels of, uh, sprites. Yeah, so this game is definitely a not that bad. It's actually a pretty decent alternative to uh, Street Fighter 2's. It's uh, not quite a ripoff, of course. Uh, World Heroes is considered a ripoff to a certain extent because it closely resembles Street Fighter 2 quite a bit. And I can understand how people say it's a ripoff. I honestly, I love uh, World Heroes. I think World Heroes is actually pretty good. And there's actually two World Heroes, one and two. And, uh, the game over screen kind of sucks. I mean, usually the other fighting games will show a little portrait of the, uh, 
the characters and uh, whichever one got their ass kicked, you, you can visibly see it. I will definitely pick this up if you're a fan of Street Fighter 2 and you're, you're looking for something different to play. Uh, not a, now, before we do the reviews right here, I mean, just keep in mind, this is a list of consoles that released in around 95, 96. I mean, check this out. We got Sega Saturn, PlayStation, and the Nintendo 64. Now, for some godforsaken reason, the Super Nintendo was still releasing games at the end of 96, which I don't, do not understand because, guess what? A lot of people moved on to one of those three consoles right there. So let's check those games out. You release too late on this gaming console. Oh, yeah. So here we are playing Donkey Kong Country 3. Let's see if we can get the uh, title screen to come up here. We have a fancy looking uh, title screen animation. As always, from Donkey Kong, any of the Donkey Kong games on Super Nintendo. And as you can see there, this game came out in the late 1996, which is pretty damn ridiculous. As you can see here, this is a little demonstration of what the maps look like in this game. Pretty much the same as uh, the other two games. Now, this is a little bit of a gameplay sample. It looks pretty much identical to the other two games, maybe with a little slight enhancement. Uh, definitely an awesome game. My favorite is the first one, of course, but uh, this game came out way too late. You release too late on this gaming console. Oh, yeah. Unfortunately, there was already three new consoles that came out by the time this game came out. I mean, look at this. I'm surprised they did not release a Donkey Kong Country on 64. I don't understand why they did not, but... Uh, who the hell was holding on to their Super Nintendo by the end of 96? It doesn't even make sense. I mean, let's check out what we have here. Put a VCR tape in. That's how old that is. It's only a, probably a couple more years later, and then we had DVDs. And I mean, look at some digitized, awesome-looking animation. Here I am riding a boat. Look at this. It's pretty awesome. Here we have Cobra Triangle with a fat ape. Look at that. What the hell is that? You're breaking her back. All right, so just like in all the other Donkey Kongs, you have to collect the uh, letters that appear until you get all the Donkey Kong letters. K-O-N-G. He's carrying a big, huge jug of something. What is that, bear? All right. I'm swimming in the water, collecting the bananas. Look at this, the same old stuff that you would get in a Donkey Kong Country game. And uh, once again, my favorite is definitely the first one. Very, very addicted to that game. And if you like the first and second one, you're guaranteed to have a lot of fun playing this one because it's pretty much the same, but with new levels. Get over here, you bastard. And there is the end of the level right there. Simple enough. And then you move on to the next level. Surprise that it released at the end of 96. I mean, what the hell? How come it did not come out on uh, 64 instead? Like an enhanced version of this game on Nintendo 64. That would have been awesome. Or how about a compilation of Donkey Kong Country 1, 2, and 3 on Nintendo 64? Huh? You release too late on this gaming console. Oh, yeah. And then that brings us to our next game, Kirby Superstar. And check this out. This almost looks like something you would see on 64. I mean, look at this fancy looking introduction. This is definitely pushing uh, the envelopes on the uh, Super Nintendo. I mean, look at that. What a fancy uh, introduction and nice looking title screen. And it looks like right away we're going to have a little uh, demonstration of what the game looks like right here. And check this out. This came out towards the end of 96. It's pretty freaking nuts that... These awesome games were still coming out in 96. I mean, what the hell? I mean, look at this. It's probably one of the best uh, Kirby games of all time, and it came out on Super Nintendo at the end of 96, and there was already PlayStation, Saturn. I mean, everybody was pretty much going for a PlayStation or a Saturn or a 64 at that time. And again, this could, be, could have been a, definitely a game that would have been much more enhanced than the 64. So this is... Kirby Superstar on Super Nintendo, it definitely released too late on this gaming console. Oh, yeah. Here, we might as well throw this game into the list too. Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3. Uh, you know, the Mortal Kombat game was definitely red hot back in the 90s on the 16-bit consoles, Genesis and Super Nintendo. And uh, this was the final Mortal Kombat game that came out 
on Super Nintendo. And it kind of almost looks like Trilogy to a certain extent. So I guess if you uh, felt like holding on to your Super Nintendo list a little bit longer, you definitely had a good fighting game to play right here. And this is basically your standard Mortal Kombat game, but it's definitely uh, the best that you're going to get on Super Nintendo. Is graphics look good. You have a lot of blood in it. And uh, there's no censorship, which is nice. And I just got my ass kicked. So you have to question yourself, like, what the hell is the point of buying this game? And why hold on to your Super Nintendo? You might as well trade that console in and buy a PlayStation or a Saturn and get Trilogy instead. <laughs> you release too late on this gaming console. Oh, yeah. And then we have this wonderful hidden gem on the Super Nintendo, which, for whatever reason, it released late 96. And this is another game that, like, holy crap. Very, very good game, but what the hell was Nintendo doing releasing it so late in the Super Nintendo's lifespan? I mean, this game definitely is a game that I remember, I don't like RPGs at all, but I remember playing this a while ago, and it was like, wow, this game's pretty awesome. And then, once again, it does look like something that would be on a Nintendo 64, but uh, guess what? It's on Super Nintendo. I mean, look at this. This is a little demonstration of what it looks like. I mean, it wouldn't be until years later I actually got the chance to play this game on an emulator, but... Uh, yeah, this game... is one of the few RPGs I actually enjoyed playing. It has fantastic graphics, fantastic story to it. The whole RPG element. It's not boring. I mean, there's a lot of RPGs that, for me, are quite boring I can't play them at all but yeah this game is pretty cool but here's the thing uh, the PlayStation and the Saturn came out probably like a year before this game released and I'm pretty sure that they already had a fair share of RPGs here and there and uh, the 64 just finally probably came out around the time that this game released which uh, it's like what the hell were you gonna actually splurge the money on buying this game, or were you gonna go out and buy the uh, PlayStation or the Sega Saturn, or you know wait for the 64 to come out? If not, it probably already did come out. And unfortunately, it came out so damn late. I, mean, it's, I don't understand it. If, they, if it would have released a couple years earlier, then a lot of people would have had their hands on this game, and it would probably not be considered a hidden shame. It would have been the hit, the number one game on the Super Nintendo. But comment down below, I mean, what would you do? Would you go for the new 32-bit, 64-bit console, or would you hold on to your Super Nintendo for the few good releases that released very, very late in the time span? So if you want to even go back further than WrestleMania the arcade game, on 16-bit consoles we had WWF Super WrestleMania, look at that. We had Hulk Hogan, look at that. And this is on the Sega Genesis version of the game. Yeah, this is the one that I do remember playing back with my cousin back in the day, look at that. What an awesome looking title screen. Now this is a very, very, very similar to uh, WrestleMania Steel Cage Challenge. On the uh, Sega Master System and the uh, NES. Except. And this version of the game. You don't have a steel cage. Which kind of sucks. However. Your uh, roster is pretty cool looking. I mean, we're going to see that Papa Shango. Earl and our Shyster. Randy Savage. British Bulldog. Hulk Hogan. Shawn Michaels. Yeah. Even uh, Ultimate Warrior. Ted DiBiase. It's uh, not a big game when it comes to uh, wrestlers. I mean, you had a handful of decent wrestlers. We'll choose Hulk Hogan. We're fighting British Bulldog. Howard Finkel was doing the ring announcer, and then we have the referee in the ring. You can see the uh, commentators at ringside. And if you ever played um, Steel Cage Challenge, then you're probably going to be very familiar with how this game plays. This is nothing but button mashing. I like how when you climb up the top rope, 
they actually retreat to the other side of the ring because they know that you're going to jump off. And once you get down, watch this. Oh, crap. What the hell is that? I did not mean to do that. I busted my hip. This came out before Royal Rumble and uh, that WWF Raw game on the uh, Genesis and Super Nintendo. So this came out first. And it was, I guess, not a bad game. It was kind of like a mixture between 16-bit. Uh, Watch this. You climb up there. He retreats. Climb down. If I can climb down. All right. That is funny. What a stupid AI. Yeah, so that's basically how this game plays. There's nothing really fancy about it at all. You can see even the crowd doesn't even move. It was basically the first WWF game on uh, the 16-bit consoles, both Super Nintendo and Genesis. I mean, the Super Nintendo version had a slightly different roster. I don't recall exactly who's on their roster. Uh, but the Genesis version is as fold. It looks exactly like this. It's not a bad game at all. It's pretty, uh, well, we had a 10 count. What the hell? How the hell? He was outside the ring, too. That's bullshit. For uh, that time period, the NES is almost 10 years old, for Christ's sake. So it, is, it looks pretty good. And then we have the, uh, this game right here, Turtles in Time, for the, uh, Super Nintendo. It's a little bit loud. What the hell's going on here? And the introduction is definitely really, really fancy. I never really played this game too much, as I always liked Manhattan Project. It was definitely my go-to game for Ninja Turtles. Uh, 16-bit consoles really did a good job at uh, you know, cartoony-looking graphics, and anything like The Lion King or any Disney games or Ninja Turtle games, for that matter, uh, always looked really, really good on 16-bit consoles. And look, there's more balls. All right, so we're going to play one player. Here's your select screen right here. It looks a little bit more fancier. Check that out. And uh, before we go into the game, you have a little bit of a introduction right here. And what the hell was that? The whole Statue of Liberty disappeared. We got a shredder on the screen right there laughing his ass off. And he's basically just stole the Statue of Liberty. And what, what the hell kind of crap is that? It's Splinter right there in the center. And right away, the controls definitely feel more responsive in this game. It's definitely a uh, more fast pace. It's really cool that you can see uh, New York in the background. Look at that. There's that. Once again, we get more balls. The big ball is a common enemy. Yeah, let's see if we can walk around that ball. I wonder how many games the ball has appeared in. Now, this time, the ball actually works in my favor because they actually crushed the uh, Foot Clan. It's absolutely nothing worse, but... Dying at the hand of a giant ball. I mean, look at that. I'm going to be honest, I never actually really played too much of this game before because, uh, you know, back when I was younger, I had NES all the way up to, like, 98. So I skipped over 16-bit uh, consoles. I uh, only played 16-bit consoles. What the hell's that? At maybe a friend's house or something like that. Or maybe when it was on display inside of a store. Look at the ass on that forehead. Uh, one thing that's really cool is when you uh, flick the uh, Foot Clan towards the foreground of the screen, you can actually see them flying towards you, and that's actually pretty awesome. It gives it that, like, a dimension that separates a regular 2D beat-em-up and this game right here, because it kind of adds, like, an extra dimension to it. And that is Ninja Turtles, Turtles in Time for the uh, Super Nintendo. It's actually a pretty good game. And uh, supposedly it's probably one of the best, according to a lot of uh, Turtle fans who uh, play Turtle games. So yeah, this game is, uh, by popular demand, it's probably one of the better games, if not the best. So let's check out a few other Turtle games. Now here's uh, Tournament Fighters. Pretty much the same game that was on the NES, but it's a 16-bit version. The Super Nintendo version, and you can definitely tell big difference. Uh, it definitely has that Street Fighter 2 look to it. Oh yeah, there's a big, big difference. You, know, you have to get definitely more characters too, I believe. Look at that. And it looks like uh, in the Tournament Edition, you get a little introduction uh, before you start the game. Now on the NES version, I did not play the Tournament Edition. I played regular Versus, so it may be on the uh, NES version as well, but I'm not certain. So it definitely looks like something uh, like a Street Fighter 2 knockoff. 
Well, I'm pretty okay with that. I'm pretty much definitely okay with that because if you have Street Fighter 2, oh yeah, the shows are pretty much close to Street Fighter 2. Yeah, they're very similar to Street Fighter 2, the controls, and uh, the graphics are really, really cool. Uh, I definitely approve this game. This game is actually uh, interesting. I'm getting my ass kicked right now because I'm pretty much uh, never played this game before. But this is a game I'll probably go back and check out. So I do uh, enjoy playing a good fighter. And, uh, you know, what, what's better than having a, a decent fighter themed off of the Ninja Turtles? I mean, that's pretty cool. And here we have a uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the Hyperstone Heist on the Sega Genesis. And this is another uh, probably heavily overlooked Turtles game. Usually it's the Super Nintendo Turtles game that steals all the thunder. But check this out. Awesome introduction. Look at this. Very similar to uh, Manhattan Project on the uh, NES. And check that out. What a cool introduction. Look at that. Hyperstone Heist, and you have the city in the background. That is awesome looking. And uh, once again, it's a very similar select screen. Uh, you know, pretty similar to what you saw in the uh, SNES version. Let's choose a turtle. And uh, once again, it looks like a very similar uh, introduction to what you saw in the... Uh... Look at that. It looks pretty much the same as what you saw in the SNES game. It's the Manhattan's disappearing. What the hell? It almost seems that the Super Nintendo and Genesis games are based off the same exact story and timeline, but in different levels. I would probably say that the uh, Sega Genesis introduction is a little bit more elaborate. It has a, a little bit more to it. You can actually see Shredder actually place the Statue of Liberty on like a makeshift model of Manhattan. That's actually pretty cool. And in this game you start off actually in the sewer. While the Super Nintendo version starts off above ground. And uh, yeah, the controls feel really nice on this game too. Nice and responsive. And the graphics are uh, definitely uh, very, very nice. 16-bit graphics. Uh, with 16-bit graphics, they definitely look more closer to the real thing, like the actual real cartoon. Now, remember, that was one of the big selling points of the uh, Sega Genesis when it first came out. And you have pizza right here. You have more of these uh, robot creatures. Maybe instead of Domino's and Pizza, it was Little Caesars this time. And there was also um, a few other uh, Ninja Turtles games that came out afterwards on, like, Game Boy... Game Boy Advance, Game Boy Color probably, and then, you know, probably DS, but I'm not going to review or demonstrate those, because it's way, way, way too many. I think there is even one that came out on GameCube. So I'm just going to stick with pretty much the 8-bit and 16-bit games for now. And yeah, this game's uh, not bad. I mean, you start off in the sewer, so once you get out of the sewer, it's going to be pretty much... Uh, Really decent game. I'm not really big on the sewer level, to be honest. Alright, we're on the streets. And it definitely looks uh, a bit different than the uh, Super Nintendo version. Background uh, lacks detail that the uh, Genesis is capable of. I'd probably say that the uh, environment graphics look better a little bit on the Super Nintendo. Oh, that is cool. Look at that. You break the fire hydrant. Yeah, so this is uh, Hyperstone Heist. On the Sega Genesis, it's actually a pretty good game, it's not bad. So if you had a Genesis and uh, you want a pretty decent Ninja Turtle game, this is definitely the one to get. It's actually pretty good. And uh, last but not least, you had Ninja Turtles Tournament Fighters on the Sega Genesis as well. Let's check this out. And the uh, title screen definitely looked uh, nice around the Super Nintendo. I definitely will admit that. I'm usually a Genesis fanboy, but... Yeah, in this case, Super Nintendo wins. And, uh, yeah, check out that select screen right there. Pretty cool. Now, that's interesting. On the, uh, Super Nintendo version, I believe that the stages only took place in the United States. In this one, you can actually go to different planets. So here we are playing... Oh, wow, I get my ass destroyed real quick. It definitely appears that this game is uh, a little bit more tougher to play on the Genesis. 
you probably want to look at a manual before you uh, play this game because uh, it's probably each turtle has a slightly different move set. It's based off of, I believe, Street Fighter moves, the same as the Super Nintendo. But I don't think each turtle has the same exact moves. Oh, look, there's actually an instant replay feature on this, too. That's really cool. It's, like, way, way ahead of its time. Despite that, this game uh, does appear to be a real prick. It's, like, super hard. It's really strange that the Super Nintendo version is so much easier. Trying to figure out how to perform moves. Oh, got one move in right there. This uh, Casey Jones clone guy is just, he's a complete asshole. It's like difficulty levels on a complete prick mode. If Game Palooza had a prick hall of fame, he'd be in it. Yeah, so this game's not bad. The Super Nintendo version, I was pulling off a little bit more moves. I, that was pretty cool. I don't know what the hell. Whoa. Okay, so I'm getting used to it. And I just beat him. Yeah, take that, you son of a bitch. Nothing feels better than beating a prick. Yeah, I like this game. This game's pretty cool. Street Fighter 2 with Ninja Turtles is awesome. So if you're a fan of like Street... Oh, well, yeah, take that. How you like that, huh? If you're a fan of like uh, World Heroes or Street Fighter 2, yeah, this game... This is probably a... You must play through it at least once. Especially if you like Ninja Turtles. I'm gonna have to check this out. Back in the late 70s and 80s, SNK designed arcade games, which became quite popular around the world. Eventually, SNK started developing and publishing gaming console games for the NES. After getting a taste of the NES gaming console, they decided to create their own gaming console. In 1990, SNK introduced the Neo Geo gaming console for a whopping $650 is way more than one thousand dollars in today's money that's a lot of money what the hell the controllers were massive and the game cartridges were huge and the games actually costed over two hundred dollars per game snk refused to call their console 16-bit and referred to it as a 24-bit console so guess what it's 8-bit better than the sega genesis and super nintendo or is it let's find out so right here, we have a little bit of a demonstration of the Neo Geo versus the Super Nintendo. And at the top, you see the speculation differences between both consoles. The uh, Neo Geo obviously had uh, a better processor and more RAM, more video RAM. And uh, you can see right here, there's a portion of the game that was not in Super Nintendo during the introduction. And this the title screen right here. And they look pretty close to the same. Now, this is where you see a slight difference. Yeah, colors on the Super Nintendo appear to be more washed out. Uh, nonetheless, the uh, detail does pretty much look pretty close to the same. The character models look pretty close to the same as well. Uh, we have our uh, best players screen right here. And this is actually a little side-by-side -side comparison of the character model. And uh, as you can see there, they do look pretty close to the same. And uh, pretty interesting. I actually like the Super Nintendo version of that character better. Now right here we have the Sega Genesis version of the same exact game. We're, we're going to do another side-by-side -side comparison. At the top, you can see that the processor on the Genesis matches the Neo Geo closer to the actual real thing versus the Super Nintendo's much powerful processor. And we have the title screen. They look pretty almost identical. And check that out. As you can see here, this is probably not the same exact map, but you can tell that the colors are not washed out on the Genesis version. It looks more native towards what the original game was. It looks a lot more um, loyal to the original uh, Neo Geo version of the game. And we have the best player screen. And here's another example of the, uh, the character model right here. And it looks very, very close to the original. Was it really worth paying that much more for the Neo Geo? Who knows? I guess if you want the real arcade experience, it's worth it. And here we have a little bit of a comparison between the uh, Neo Geo and the Super Nintendo with the game World Heroes. It's definitely one of my favorite SNK games. I definitely have uh, both the Super Nintendo and Genesis version of the game. I definitely cannot afford the Neo Geo version of the game, so... Uh, let's check out the uh, comparison right here. The title screens look pretty close. See the Neo Geo on uh, this portion of the game right here uh, looks definitely uh, more detailed. The uh, select screen looks 
similar, not quite the same. And uh, right here, the mode select screen look quite similar, and here's the uh, bonus portion of the game right here. You get to beat up a boulder, and you can tell the sprites on the Super Nintendo version are smaller. Nonetheless, it actually plays quite well, and it looks good enough for Super Nintendo standards. To be quite honest, uh, the Super Nintendo version of this game is definitely my favorite. Uh, the controls are excellent. They did a good job porting the game over to Super Nintendo, and the uh, Neo Geo version does have more details, more animation, as you can see there. Now let's check out what an actual match looks like in this game. You can still see in the Super Nintendo version all the people in the background waving their hands around, and, you know, it actually pretty good. Now as you can see on the ground on the Neo Geo version the actual words deathmatch is uh, illuminating like from bright to dark on the uh, Super Nintendo version you really don't see that that well it kinda does it but not quite. Uh, so the Super Nintendo does have its limitations nonetheless it does play perfectly fine. It's actually a great game on the Super Nintendo great alternative to Street Fighter 2, uh, but you can clearly see the difference between both the Neo Geo and the Super Nintendo version. But, would you rather pay $50 for the Super Nintendo version or the 200 or whatever, however, it may cost more than $200, uh, would you be willing to pay that much more for the Neo Geo version of the game? That's the question. Uh, personally, for me, I'm not seeing really that much big of a difference to even want to pay that much more. And here we have the uh, Neo Geo vs. Sega Genesis, the same exact game. And you can see the title screens right here and see what we got going on here. See if we can fix this. So here we go, we have a side-by-side -side comparison of this portion of the game right here. It looks a little bit closer to the same. Now the select screen looks very different. The uh, Genesis version looks like a bit of a sloppy port for some reason. And uh, you can see in this portion of the game, uh, the people in the background don't move quite as much as the, uh, the SNES version of the game. Uh, but the game still looks very good on the Sega Genesis. It looks like it was definitely modified in the background, like they kind of changed it up a little bit. Uh, the deathmatch words on the map do not blink. They just kind of stay one shade of color, which is per perfectly fine. Uh, some people may prefer the uh, Genesis controller for this style of game, a fighting game. Uh, I personally like the SNES version better, but I do love the Sega Genesis better in general, especially for fighting games. Yeah, it call me crazy, but it kind of looks like the uh, crowd has more detail on the Genesis version. Now, as you can see here, the Neo Geo had a lot of games that appeared on 16-bit consoles, Sega Genesis, and Super Nintendo. Uh, but that goes to show you, like, is the Neo Geo worth purchasing back in the day? I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, you can buy both the Super Nintendo and the Sega Genesis for the same price. So the combination of Having to own an A16 bit console and eventually going out and buying a 32 bit console. I mean, you're still able to buy Neo Geo games on either console that you buy, the PlayStation or the Sega Saturn. Uh, and, and it may be around the same price, so go figure. Uh, the Sega Saturn did cost quite a bit though, so I'm not sure about that. But Sega Saturn was the ultimate 2D console, it could probably play anything that was on the Neo Geo. Uh, that's the reason why there was a lot of King of Fighter games on that on that console. Uh, ultimately, I guess if you were into arcade perfection, the Neo Geo had the joystick. It had literally the hardware built into the huge cartridges that it had. So if you wanted the real thing, then yeah, then it would be worth buying the Neo Geo console. But yeah, what do you think? Is the Neo Geo console really worth purchasing back in the day? Or would you swing towards buying the, the Genesis, the Super Nintendo, and then eventually buying the Saturn or the PlayStation? 
which way would you swing? Buying the, the 600 and something dollar console Neo Geo or buying the other consoles? Because you can literally buy all of them for the same price. Let me know down below.